皆さん、こんにちは。えー、みなつくの森と申します。よろしくお願いします。えー、っと、なんか授業を見てくださった方もいるかなと思うんですけれども、えっと、今日は、あの、前回、あの、サンセバスチャンの、まあ、食文化の取り組みについて、ちょっとお話をさせていただいて、で、今日はそのバスククリナリーセンターで、えっと、まあ、チーフ、シェフっていう形で、あのシェフとしても活躍をしながら、研究員としても取り組みをされている、マイステファニアさんにお話をお伺いしようっていう、そういう1時間になっています。で、えっと、全体としては、最初の30分ぐらいは、あの僕の方から、あのー、質問を3つ、あの、金井教授からいただいているので、それについて、あのー、質問させてもらって、で、残りの後半30分は、皆さんの方から質問をいただいているので、あのそれをせっかくなんで、あの、皆さんの方から日本語でもいいですし、英語でもいいので、質問していただけるといいかなと思っています。で、えっと、日本語で質問される場合は、あの、僕が通訳入れるので、そこはあの大丈夫です。So, time has come, so let us start the interview. All right. Yeah,、uh, thank you very much again, Estefania,、uh, for this opportunity. So, we are the group of a、uh, uh, research group of a r i t s u m e i k a n University located in Kyoto. No, Shiga. It's in a neighboring prefecture of Kyoto. So, it is a food management department. So,、mm -hmm. we, I, I had a lecture about、um, San Sebastian and about BCC last, last month. So, they are really interested in like, having more. Understanding about BCC and the San Sebastian、uh, area. So that is why we have、uh, this kind of like interview, online interview, like lecture for the student to have further understand how like San Sebastian can be such a like excellent city for its、uh, food industry, especially. So, yeah, thanks so much. So, to explain more about this project,、uh, Kajiwara san can、uh, introduce it in Spanish. So, Kajiwara san, what do you think about it? Hi, I'm very good. I'm a professor in the past. And, lamentably, I'm not going to be able to do it in a funeral. So, I'm going to be able to do it in a funeral. And, I'm going to be able to do it in a funeral. Aprender a escribir tesis. Y recién este mayo abrió esta, esta clase y para, para estimular y para ver diferentes cosas. Estamos invitando varios profesionales y uno de ellos fue、eh, Masataka Morizan. Y nos、eh, era su, su video, su lectura sobre San Sebastián. era Era muy interesante y nos, nosotros queríamos saber más. Y gracias a él, usted está aquí y estamos. Yo estoy muy fascinada. Este, este febrero viajé a San Sebastián con mis papás. Así que es un, un gran ciudad. Y bueno, a través de la historia oscura, ahora ustedes tienen una cultura abundante. Así que con mucho, mucho respeto. Bueno, esto es, es un placer tener un, un tiempo con usted. Igualmente. Gracias. Gracias.、Mm -hmm. Ok, thank you so much. So, it's funny, for the interview, I will ask the question in Japanese and then I will explain it in,、uh, no, 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 in English and in Japanese. And you can、um, answer it with English and I will translate it into Japanese to the student. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, for the introduction, Espania, can you quickly、uh, introduce yourself and your project in BCC? And、right. I will translate into Japanese. Yeah, no problem.、Mm -hmm. so, um, so, I don't know if you explained this part, but maybe it is interesting to understand a little bit of the ecosystem of BCC to the students first. So, basically,、yeah. BCC has three big areas of expertise. One of、yeah. the is the university, in which we have a degree、um, that it's an official degree. 
uh, in um, gastronomic sciences. We have an official master's degree in uh, mm -hmm. gastronomic sciences. And we also just started this year a doctorate's program mm -hmm. um, in gastronomy as well. Also, mm -hmm. we have uh, all sorts of courses, uh, master's spe specializations and courses for enthusiasts from the city or tourists that want to learn more about gastronomy, either local or avant-garde, right? Mm -hmm. So that is uh, mostly about education, right? Then mm -hmm. uh, we have the Technology Center specializing in gastronomy, which is where I work, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of the R&D uh, department and where we have the doctorate uh, students working in their projects um, of the Basque Culinary Center. Mm -hmm. So there we have uh, three big areas of work. Okay. One, it's about um, startups and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other one is about research. Um, we, we mostly research about consumer and sensory sciences and mm -hmm. health. And then we have the culinary innovation area, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, for new product development and everything that has to do with chefs mm -hmm. and um, R&D projects. Um, mm -hmm. As of uh, this uh, spring, we started a new line of business that is headed by me, which is um, strategy work. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's about uh, helping companies or public administrations around the world understand which are the possibilities there are in gastronomy. Should I go slower? I, I don't know if you're... Yeah, can I... Can I, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. No, 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 it's okay. No. So the university is one. The second yeah. one is the technology center. And I'm going to finish up with the third one. Okay. Um, so basically technology center, entrepreneurship, research, innovation, and strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third line of the big uh, Basque Culinary Center ecosystem is events, communication, okay. and all that has to do with um, communicating about our work and our culture to the world. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's, that's Basque Culinary Center. And as I said, I am the lead or the principal of the strategy department, okay. helping companies and governments try to figure out where opportunity lies Mm -hmm. um, in gastronomy uh, for their organization. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. It's funny. Can you introduce yourself? Right. Um, so I am Estefania Simon Safik. Um, I am from Venezuela originally. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been a chef for the past uh, 13, 14 years. Um, and since the last two and a half, I've been working in Basque Culinary Center. So my career before the Basque Culinary Center, I uh, work my, my way up the ladder in restaurants in Michelin star and 50 best restaurants. And my last uh, job in a restaurant was in my own restaurant, which I opened in Bali in Indonesia. Um, but uh, I took the job to come to the Basque Culinary Center afterwards. And from there, I started doing uh, product development and a lot of um, recipe development for big brands in Europe. And then pivoted uh, to start a strategy work, mostly based on applying foresight to uh, food to understand what could be the future possibilities of gastronomy and how we can collaborate, um, you know, different disciplines to, to create really interesting projects. So that's a little bit of my professional mm -hmm. um, career course, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Esfania, for your introduction. So before we go on to the question from the student, I have uh, three questions from the professor, but unfortunately he's not here for like some um, some troubles. So instead of him, I will ask three questions, first of all. So the first question is related to career design and motivation. So you are born in Venezuela and you had a restaurant in Bali, but you are currently working in BCC in San Sebastian. So it's a, you have a, like a global career as a chef and also researcher and also like professionals. So why, what made you to work on the like the project related to the food all over the world not only like um focusing on some specific area or some specific country mm, i think 
I think the, the question you would like to hear is that I planned it, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, um, well, I think, uh, it, I think it's um, related with my international background as my mm -hmm. family background to begin with. And okay. then I think it has to do with curiosity and also ambition, I think this too. So mm -hmm. I am I am the daughter of immigrants. My grandmother uh, is Hungarian, and my grandfather fa was Ukrainian. And on my father's side, he's first generation immigrant from Chile, and his parents are immigrants from Lebanon. So we're all <laughs> immigrants, and my daughter will be born in San Sebastian. So mm -hmm. I think um, I think it's easier to think as the world of something more plastic mm. when you come from this family back background mm. to begin with, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, when I finished high school, I was very rebellious and um, I didn't want to study anymore. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and sort of out of luck, I stumbled into um, this career as chef and, you know, a, a chefing school in my hometown of Caracas, Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting. And I got the opportunity to come stage as my uh, first like international job to a three star here in the Basque country, Martin Berasategui. Mm. So I came here when I was uh, very young, I think 17 or 18 years old, uh, right out of um, high school, almost. Mm. I mean, it's been a long time since then. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think like um, coming from a country that is not top, top notch education, like, mm. I don't know, US Ivy League or maybe Japanese uh, mm. uh, universities, um, you could really tell that uh, I could really tell that I was in an excellent place. Mm. And maybe it was a better opportunity than going to a university that had just like medium or good enough or regionally good um, mm. education being here in a three star that was recognized all over the world it really felt like I was getting some training that was top notch mm -hmm. first class right mm -hmm. so this is why I decided to stay here for two years and work for Martin Berasategui and after that it just uh, became like I think yeah a mix between curiosity and trying to stay in the top of my game in that sense, to be really always in top-notch restaurants. So uh, I was in some um, Michelin stars uh, in other countries of Europe. And then in 2013, I had a really amazing experience because I worked uh, in Japan, mm -hmm. in um, Ryugin in Tokyo, and then mm -hmm. in Kichisen in Kyoto which are both uh, two Michelin star restaurants. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an amazing opportunity and it really opened my vision towards sort of the world, right? Like not only Europe and Eurocentric approach to my career, but really like how vast it can be and how many like really amazing points of view there are. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so that really sparked my curiosity and I just couldn't get enough. So I was sort of like, um, in a very exploratory phase um, for the first 10 years of my career. And now I've been um, almost three years here. And mm -hmm. I feel like I could be staying here longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you very much. So as for the second question uh, in Japanese, えっと、2つ目は彼女がバスクリナリーセンターで今どんなプロジェクトに関わっているかってことについて聞きたいと思います。リンダスタンド。オッケー。さあ、アドモーメント、わかなプロジェクトアーユーエンゲージングフォーザ
So we have done a research for two or three months, which ended up in, our, in a report that's been published, I think, a week or two ago, mm -hmm. um, where we explore, instead of saying, this is going to happen, this is the future, this is what you should do, we have explored four possible scenarios and how mm -hmm. they play out differently. Um, based on some uncertainties uh, that we all have, as in how will the economic recovery will be and uh, will there be European cooperation or not, um, et cetera, right? Um, and we have uh, studied and um, done some foresight work on understanding how this might impact our sector, the food sector. So understanding what challenges might arise and what opportunities could arise that could help us innovate no matter in which scenario. So this is a big, big project I've been working on and we will have a webinar on Tuesday Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some really interesting experts. Um, I will send the invitation your way, but it will be regrettably in Spanish. So, so maybe Chito San will be able mm -hmm. to attend and yeah. maybe someone else that talks in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, we will start a big project that is a think tank, think tank mm -hmm. for um, all our collaborators to come together and think about opportunities and challenges uh, strategically and how to generate a net network of uh, joint challenges mm -hmm. or joint projects. So this will all kick off on Tuesday and that will be officially my last day at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we will um, come back to it, I think in March with a second session of innovation of the think tank. Um, so that's the biggest project or the most ambitious one we're um, spearheading now. We mm -hmm. also are doing some really interesting studies about new technologies in freezing. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and understanding with different segments what opportunities or new products would be interesting to develop. So, mm -hmm. this project has been uh, in three phases, which is sort of our expertise. Uh, the first phase was doing a trends report about freezing and how this technology could improve or what opportunities might arise. Now, we're in a phase of interviewing people from uh, uh, restaurants and cafes from three Michelin star to small uh, mom and pops restaurants to understand what they need and we will end this study with uh, a thousand consumers to understand maybe what are they missing mm -hmm. um, from this sort of product development mm -hmm. so that's another one and finally we are proposing a lot of projects in Latin America um, to help in Latin America to mm -hmm. help boost uh, entrepreneurship in a community level. Mm -hmm. So very similar to what you guys, to what we were talking when you guys came here, right? Um, so we have a proposal for a network of culinary labs in Ecuador. We mm -hmm. have a big proposal for um, five different countries of South America from Mexico to Chile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have one proposal in Costa Rica, also for regional development. Mm -hmm. So those are the little projects that I have to <laughs> overlook. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am surprised I still have hair. No, I'm joking. You don't need to translate this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The third question is, is that the woman is chief scientist, so she is doing some leadership work. So I want to ask you the last question. Okay, Stefania, this is the last question for me. So you are working in BCC as a chief researcher, right? Chief chef. Chef researcher. Chef researcher, okay. Yeah. But like you are also like having a project with uh, many stakeholders, not only in BCC, but also many, many stakeholders in the ecosystem. So mm. how do you take a leadership? Uh, with uh, like how do I say like to promote the co-creation and co-visioning with stakeholder with different backgrounds and different ideas um, so 
I think it's a combination uh, between uh, my previous career as a head chef of restaurants. Mm, definitely. And yeah, that's, that's a lot of bossing around people. <laughs> and, um, and I think uh, the opportunity to be able to collaborate in teams that are multidisciplinary from the get-go mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in Basque Culinary Center. Mm -hmm. So this had really laid the ground uh, for me to be able to sort of develop that um, in, in that field and in that skill. I think, um, I think I have a natural inclination to sort of um, take some leadership and mm -hmm. try to push projects ahead. Uh, to be honest, I think some other people may need to um, cultivate that a little more. Maybe that wasn't really the challenge for me. Uh, mm -hmm. It was more about uh, pivoting from working with knives to working with computers, you know, mm -hmm. that that was hard. Um, so, yeah, so in the kitchen, um, you need to organize teams of uh, 50 or 60 people mm -hmm. to work really fast under pressure. And it makes you to be a really direct communicator mm -hmm. um, and to be very organized. Mm -hmm. And then when we, when I came here and started working with uh, scientists with mm -hmm. 10 years plus of, uh, you know, being a doctorate and a PhD and, uh, you know, some really, really impressive people that I work with, mm -hmm. you stop thinking in hierarchy like you do in kitchens and you you start understanding that you're not like the boss of anyone and that mm -hmm. you have to sort of... Um, make the best out of everyone's, um, you know, expertise in every project. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a lot of soft skills too to it. So I think there is a lot of like understanding the person besides the professional and sort of um, making some social capital within every project to, for people to be flexible and more patient and more willing to give a nice result to the project. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, if you look like you're sad, I will take five minutes to see what's what's up with you mm -hmm. before going into working. Because mm -hmm. I think doing projects with people that come from such different backgrounds, we yeah. really need to exercise a little empathy and, you know, and try to understand where the other person's coming from. And this can only come from, like, soft skills and, like, Mm. having genuine interest in other people right mm. well. i hope this answer helps <laughs> yeah definitely it is thanks so much <laughs> so ja koko kara ano minasan kara no shitsumon wo ano kiite itadakou to omou node ano ichiyo jizai ni shitsumon wa itadaite iru n desu kere domo kore made no hanashi no naka de motto koi no kiite mitai to ka ano koi no ano dou nan darou tiyu no wo chotto あの聞いていただければと思うので、えっと、これ聞きたいっていう人がいたら、ちょっと画面上でこう手を挙げていただけると、僕はちょっと当てて、ミュート解除してもらって、英語か日本語で答えてもらえればと思うので。So, for, for me, I think、um, it is really important to, even if you come from Basque Culinary Center, which has like a very like Uh, international reputation, or、mm -hmm. you're a chef with 20 years' experience. I think the key to understanding or developing projects uh, with um, countries that you're not from and cultures that you're not familiar with i t s really collaborating instead of you know, saying your opinion or just doing some research and getting to some conclusion. You know what I mean?、Mm -hmm. So I think it's really, really important.、Um, and Uh, this is what、uh, we proposed to Masa Masakata at the moment, like、mm -hmm. when we were talking, which is、um, get together a lot of people that are involved in food and the food culture、uh, from different points of view. So, restaurants, food industry, citizens, researchers. So, a lot of people that work with food and maybe not connect in an、mm -hmm. everyday basis. Mm -hmm. And get them to talk to each other and answer to some questions and mostly like construct where we're going. Because when you study another culture,、mm -hmm. you do it with a purpose, right? With a goal.、Mm -hmm. So、um, the idea would be to take this 
stakeholders mm -hmm. and reflect together in a goal. Um, you can direct the conversation so the research goes to answer your own questions and your own key um, points about what you're looking for. But yeah, you, I think you need to involve people, stakeholders from all the ecosystem of food and to do it with a purpose. Like what's the end goal of doing this, right? And taking the, the people towards that goal. So I think uh, the most striking one was, I am from South America mm -hmm. and um, I went to Southeast Asia to work. Mm -hmm. So I worked in Singapore and then I worked in Indonesia and traveled around a little bit, um, mostly Thailand, right? And uh, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So basically I thought it was really striking how the food was so similar, like the ingredients, mm -hmm. um, even the people, I would say, but that's not gastronomy necessarily. I mean, not in a strict uh, sense, but I was very su surprised about how with the same ingredients, um, the food was so different. Mm. So for example, we wrap things in banana leaves, mm. but us is mostly based in corn as in Southeast Asia, it was mostly based um, in rice, but also they had like, all sorts of things uh, wrapped in, ba in banana leaf, which we mm. don't really do. And then, mm. for example, they have papaya and mango and mm. all this like tropical fruits. But in Southeast Asia, they use it green as well, right? Like the green papaya salad, or they put it in the soup. And for us, this never happens. We never, <laughs> um, yeah, like it's, it's out of question. Mm. So we only eat these fruits when they're ripe. And there's actually, if you go to the FAO uh, food waste report, which I really recommend, um, one of the biggest food losses in South America is ripe fruit. Mm. So what if we could have some, you know, interesting cultural exchanges that uh, allow us to unlock knowledge that helps us, you know, prevent food loss and food mm -hmm. waste. Um, so that was um, very striking to me. And I also think it's really interesting to see um, the similar similarities uh, among um, cuisines in Asia, like uh, Japan and Korea and China and uh, how they, in the European version, they seem so different. But then mm -hmm. in like the home cooking version, they do share roots, right? And it's really interesting to understand that from like a foreigner's point of view, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it's really interesting to see how, for example, in Indonesia, you can tell that there's a um, big influence from the East, but also like an influence from India. And it makes perfect sense, like geographically, mm -hmm. because it is sort of like islands in the middle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and those that are closer to India sort of are more curryish. And those that are more up north, um, they're more like Chinese influence and so on. Um, and then there's also this amazing thing. I'm sorry, I'm just, this is a subject I can go on forever, but I'm just <laughs> going to give you one more. Um, so when I was working in Peru, uh, I work in a restaurant that works with indigenous communities that like have really, really millennia year old um, knowledge about food uh, in South America, right? In the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So I went uh, to visit this community several times and uh, one of the most interesting preparations they had was fermenting cassava uh, mm -hmm. to have it as a drink, right? Mm -hmm. Like little alcohol and like a lot of new ones. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, wow, this is so obscure, right? Like it was really exotic, like in the framework of um, Latin American mainstream food fermentation, it's not really that predominant mm. and fermented cassava for a drink was really like exotic, right? To, so to say. And then when I went to Indonesia, I went to a supermarket and they sold the fermented cassava mm -hmm. like in pre-portions in okay. a supermarket. Okay. I was like, how is this possible? <laughs> Like it was convenience in one place and it was like obscure and ancestral knowledge in another place, right? Mm. Right, so there's a lot. 
<laughs> Good questions. Um, um, all right. So it is famous here. It's yeah. actually like only one street away from my house. Uh, mm -hmm. The one that is like really famous. I don't know if you know La Viña. I'm going to yeah. write it down here. Uh, La Viña Cheesecake. So I think what's interesting about this cheesecake and what made it so um, hey. famous is because it's sort of burnt on the top. I'm pretty sure you're familiar. Um, but I also think like what made it so popular in Japan, I think it's there are two things. Um, one is that you already have a cheesecake culture and mm. like it's really big there, uh, but it's a different style. And the second one i think it's um food bloggers instagrammers and so on so you get i mean um there are some bloggers that are traveling the whole world just popularizing things that they find interesting right um and we're really connected and asia is so dynamic so i think it's really easy to pick on things and try to see if there's a business opportunity in there Mm. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, internet culture and food internet, it's, it's really, really relevant to how these trends emerge. Does that answer your question? When do I find it fun? Um, I would say it's a mix between always and never. <laughs> um, I think it's this sort of opportunities like today to be able to get out of your everyday and organizing and sending emails and just, you know, doing like operational things. These are the best parts of, of work, right? Like to be able to share with you and see you and see that there's a lot of people that have a passion for food. I think it's amazing. I think it's the most fun of the work. Um, I think there's also a lot of fun um, in sort of like creating projects that are weird, like uh, to bring together different people that don't normally collaborate and do things that are new. It's very fun and very exciting, but it's also very stressful. That's why I said like, it's mm -hmm. pretty mixed, right? Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot of fun in bringing people that would normally not collaborate and, you know, and try to make something unique and, you know, and bring value to the table and to, you know, and to our food industry. That's really fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was thinking more about the cheesecake. Okay. Because <laughs> also like two years ago, the mm -hmm. 50 best of the world, you know, this award, maybe, I mean, yeah. I'm going to find the link to it. Mm -hmm. It was hosted in Bilbao. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge um, sort of gastronomy lobby. Okay. A lot of uh, cities bid for it, like the Olympics, and mm -hmm. they get charged hefty um, sums for hosting mm -hmm. that event. So mm -hmm. it's not, a, it's not a casual that Basque things become fashionable one or two years later, yeah. because all of these Instagrammers, big chefs, et cetera, come to the city and then go back to their countries and talk okay. about how amazing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry, just like I was reminiscing about this question because it's a very uh, good one uh, to understand where trends come from. But these events right now in the, in the scheme of COVID are uh, suffering a lot. I mean, because we don't know if even like in two years they're going to happen, right? Yeah. So it used to be a formula and now it seems like the system is, mm. you know, disrupted. Yeah, there you go. Are you looking at it? Yeah. All right. So basically to think about these four scenarios, we've thought um, the double S sort of diagram of change. Um, uh, so normally this is one system that starts and, and ends and in the middle of one to another, there's a transition period that is very chaotic, right? So we have interpreted this moment as such. And uh, we have looked at the whole food system, but we also th uh, looked at um, the things that surround the food system and also impact it. Let me share this link with you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll share it later. All right. Yeah, I will. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and so we have uh, thought about uh, four scenarios. And of course, like this is not future telling. So it's not like a, a crystal ball. So it's more about thinking in different mindsets. And as you read to the, through the report, which I hope you find interesting and useful, um, you will see that there are elements of the different scenarios playing in reality. So it's not like everything is gray or everything is white, right? It's like, it's, it's mixed, right? But the idea is to make yourself think about different extremes to see what could happen, right? What is possible. So we came up with this four scenarios, which is continuation, business as usual. Um, and this is actually a model uh, used in foresight to think about the future. So it's not us that we came up with this structure is more that we uh, used it to um, reflect about what scenarios could be. Mm -hmm. So basically we have continuation, discipline, which is a lot of like um, government control and how the food system and the food industry is affected by it or what consequences there are. Collapse, which is nothing works anymore. And transformation, which is we take the you know, the best practices of now and yeah. move it into a different, completely scheme. Um, so we have done a little summary table of the four um, scenarios. So as I said, we have thought about the macro level context or the big uncertainties to mm -hmm. anchor our thinking around the scenarios. So as I said, um, how will the econ economy restart? Um, will there be more waves of infection, which we're seeing now it is so there's a big disclaimer like this is up to where we were researching but things are changing so fast that <laughs> you know um eu cooperation it seemed like it was going to happen now this week it seems like it's not going to happen so that's a big uncertainty too how will the consumer react will the borders reopen and to which measure and taking this, um, we have looked at what would be the biggest impacts in the food system and, the, and gastronomy. Mm -hmm. So just, I'm going to read just the first one and I'll let you look into it um, as you move forward with your reading of this document, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which I hope, I, again, you will um, do and would, I would love to receive some feedback if I could mm -hmm. get... Well, you, can, you can give my email to all of this, uh, guys, okay. there's no problem. Um, yeah. So basically, in a continuation scenario, we're thinking that the big players like Nestle, Unilever, et cetera, really get more share of the market because they are able to absorb the economic impact of the crisis, right? So this is, for example, one thing that we can foresee if things move on as if nothing happened. On the other scenario of like um, discipline, we can see uh, consumers going back to more traditional, like feeling less risky or less adventurous. They don't wanna, um, they wanna go for something that they sure like and it gives them sort of comfort. So they mm. don't wanna be challenged by food in this scenario, for example. And then collapse scenario, uh, for example, um, the product range of brand diminishes uh, dramatically to try to optimize for food for cost because the consumer just wants to save money basically mm -hmm. and in the transformation scenario we see for example an acceleration of healthy eating and maybe alternative proteins and all the things that we have said are coming trends we see this being accelerated by um, the disruption of the market Okay, thank you very much, Estefania, for answering all the questions we have from the student and me. Uh, it's really inspiring and it's so interesting to have this kind of session. So, right. Chitose will have the final comment as a Perfect. representative of this group. Uh, estoy muy emocionada de todo lo que usted nos compartió de leadership y su background y sobre COVID. <laughs> Mucho, mucho más, pero era un, un gran placer de tener usted aquí y muchísimas gracias. Y ojalá visitarte pronto. Asanse, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a ustedes por, por darme la oportunidad. Arigato gozaimashita. Yeah. <laughs>